Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto, here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. We're going to be recapping some of our favorite pearls on hematuria, which is a really common problem. And Paul, you produced this episode, so I wanted to throw it to you. Uh, gross hematuria, we shouldn't worry about it if a patient has it. That That's a low-risk feature. Is that am I, am I getting this totally wrong? Right out the gate with the classic Watto teaching point. Yeah, no, especially microscopic hematuria is the bane of primary care. Someone will get a urinalysis for whatever reason. It comes back with microscopic hematuria, and they're like, you should talk to your PCP about that. And you're like, Nurr. and that <laughs> is, a, is a different situation than the patient who comes in with, with gross hematuria, meaning they can see visible blood in their urine. And by definition, gross hematuria is a higher risk condition. And when we're talking about risk, Matt, the things that we worry about specifically is malignancy first and foremost for, in most cases, unless there's some other things that we'll talk about a little bit later on. So uh, contrary to your initial point, in fact, um, gross hematuria is, is immediately something that puts someone in a high-risk category and warrants workup. And if there's clots, you know, all the more urgency and also a little bit more suggestive that this might be a urologic cause as opposed to a glomerular cause. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and the, 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 We'll talk a little bit about the workup later, uh, how you might differentiate urologic versus glomerular causes. But we talked about the risk factors, people that have a risk for more of like a malignancy. It's uh, it, These are pretty fairly intuitive. O older age, uh, smoking history, especially if it's more than 30 pack years, the age cutoff, they say greater than 60 would be considered like the highest risk category. And then, um, uh, you, as you said, the gross hematuria, or even just having, if you're looking at the microscopic blood reported, if it's more than 25 red blood cells per high Bauer field, that puts them in that higher risk category too. Now, Paul, but if my patient's on warfarin, I'm not worried. I know why they're bleeding. They're on warfarin. <laughs> yeah, or DOEX. No, it's great, a great, great point also. So warfarin does not excuse you from working up hematuria. Uh, it's it's really interesting. In the literature, if you look at these things, the patients on, on anticoagulants um, if they have hematuria, they tend to have better outcomes and probably because the anticoagulation actually had them declare themselves earlier than they otherwise would have. So warfarin just kind of makes something that's already there more apparent. And so actually patients Amazing. on anticoagulation are still owed the same workup that anyone else with hematuria would be owed, but they actually tend to do better overall because it happens a little bit earlier in those patients, which is um, kind of a fun fact. It's one of the few times where you feel good about bleeding with warfarin. Yeah, that is that is great. So it's kind of like, you're, you you think you wouldn't be happy that you're that you're bleeding and you have you have visible blood in your urine, but maybe it saved your life that you were on that medicine that uh, unmasked whatever was going on there. Right, an unintended sort of weird adverse effect that is also maybe a positive question mark. Yeah, it's it's, it's an sure. interesting situation. Now, okay, so let's just uh, there. So we have our urologic causes of bleeding. So that could be something in the bladder, the prostate, you know, some sort of something in the urinary tract. How are we going to work up those urologic causes, Paul? What what sort of uh, testing would you recommend to the audience? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you sort of what you do in your own practice, but it, it kind of depends on the patient in front of you. So if someone is like low, moderate risk, you can maybe get away with doing an ultrasound in terms of imaging. Most of the patients are going to be are going to warrant imaging is the, is the long and the short of yeah. it. Um, and on the episode itself, Dr. Fine talks about how the ultrasound might pick up things like renal cysts, um, or other sort of larger structural causes. But the the patients, if anyone that you have real concern about, and like we talked about before, gross hematuria is a high risk thing, then they're probably gonna get a CT urogram and they're probably also gonna go for a cystoscopy. And obviously we're not, you know, we're not doing the cystoscopies in our offices, but we'll be facilitating the patient seeing urology who will help us out with that. But I think once you're in that high risk category, whether it's by age or presence of gross hematuria or uh, prolonged tobacco exposure, other risk factors, um, CT urogram and cystoscopy are where you're gonna go mostly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing the same. Most most patients, uh, if they're older, uh, you know, if I'm more worried for for malignancy because of their their pack years of smoking history, then I I'm more likely to get the CT urogram, the CT with contrast, and refer them first to cystoscopy. The the renal ultrasounds, if I'm like ah, they're like 40 years old, they never smoke, they have like four RBCs, it's microscopic blood. Maybe I'll get a renal ultrasound. I'm not as as worried, but. You know, I still have to. I still watch those people closely. Now, Paul, when should we send the patient to our friendly neighborhood nephrologist? Yeah, well, you know, man, I always just assume nephrologists are smarter than me. So almost any reason you can send one is is a good idea. But if you're worried about glomerular bleeding specifically, or let me put that a different way, things that would prompt you to worry about glomerular bleeding would be if you see any degree of albuminuria, that should make you a little bit nervous. If they have rapidly increasing blood pressure from their baseline, that should make you very nervous. 
And if they have rising creatinine, that should also make you nervous. And right. you don't necessarily see those things with all kinds of glomerular bleeding, but they that they do suggest etiologies that are worrisome and need um, sort of more urgent intervention. So if you see those things, probably that's more um, nephrologic based and that person needs a nephrologist. And and I, I think our guest even says like, this is someone for whom you make a phone call. Like you don't, like this is not someone who gets the three month follow-up. You need to get them to see them quickly. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we we do get into talking about anti-GBM disease and ANCA associated vasculitis and, you know, which, which ones have low complement or normal. Com yeah. But, that is uh, that is for the full episode, so you can click on the transcript, uh, the link in the transcript below, if you would like to hear the full episode and discussion, which I would highly recommend. We had a fantastic guest, fantastic accent too, Paul. You know, it's just a pleasure to listen to. He just sounded um, like someone you'd trust for sure. And so, with all that, this has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. And darn toot, Matt. <laughs> Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And as always, I'm Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye.